In this section, we're going to discuss some of the basic principles that we should follow in order to get good pieces out of the opening. It's not going to be an exhaustive look into all of the principles. This would simply take far too long. And of course, there are many exceptions to any rule in chess. But what we are going to do is we're going to take every piece, the knight, the bishop, the rook, the queen, and we will even touch upon the king. And we're just going to talk about the major points that should be kept in mind with regards to every piece. However, before we do that, we should talk about one very important element to ensuring that your pieces are well placed out of the opening. That has nothing to do with any particular piece. Instead, it has to do with this row here, or if you are black, this row here. What I am talking about, of course, is pawns, and specifically where we place them, our pawn structure. Okay? Because our pawn structure, one of the big things that it does, depending on how we place it, relative to how our opponent places it, is it can give us more space or it can give us less space. And this impacts how well placed our pieces can end up. Let's just show one example in this respect. So if white opens up with the move pawn to e4 and black responds with pawn to e6, this is the French defense, now white can go pawn to d4 and we immediately see that white has taken up a little bit more space of the board and now controls quite a lot of squares. Black counters this with pawn to d5. Now we have a French defense on the board. And here, let's imagine white continues with e5. This is the French advance. In this position, we already see the impact of space in order to get good squares for our pieces. So for example, if black now wanted to get ready to castle kingside, he would need to find a square for his bishop and for his knight. But let's imagine that he now chooses to play the move bishop to d6. Well, in this case, he just lost a piece. The same goes for c5. And although b4, if he were to play this move, would not lose him a piece, after the pawn goes to c3, the bishop on a5 would not be especially well placed. So we can see the impact that white's more advanced pawn structure, which gives him more space, is having on black's development. Let's say that black, instead of this, decides to go bishop to e7. White here, notice because of his extra space, he does have the option of going to d3. We saw black did not have the option of d6, but for white, that's not the case. So he may choose a move like bishop to d3. Now, black needs to figure out what to do with his knight, but we see that the bishop is stepping on the toes of the knight, so to speak. So the knight would like to go to the most centralized square. That's something we'll talk about very soon. But if the knight goes to f6, then pawn takes knight. So the only move left would be a move like knight to h6. But if this happens, then bishop takes h6, pawn takes bishop, and we see that black has ruined his pawn structure. And this means that a move like kingside castling is no longer very attractive. Now, if white decides to continue his development from this position, well, he would probably play the move knight to f3, centralizing his knight and defending his center, and now preparing to castle. Notice how the f3 square is absolutely available for white, but for black, as we saw a short while ago, that was not an option. So we see once again that space advantage. If instead white decided he wanted to go knight h3 to sort of follow in the footsteps of black one move ago, notice how in this case white is not at risk of bishop takes knight because the pawn on e6 means that this bishop on c8 is much more restricted than its counterpart for white 
the bishop on c1. So we see that we cannot really talk about getting good pieces out of an opening without paying close attention to the pawn structure. And that's the first part of this section. With that out of the way, let's now talk about the remaining pieces. The first piece that we're going to discuss is the knight. Now, when it comes to knights, there's a couple of things we should keep in mind. First of all, knights love to be posted somewhere near the center. So, in general, if we place a knight anywhere near the center, this can be, let's say, the heart of the center, but we can expand this to include more squares. If you can place a knight anywhere in that region of the board, it's going to be a lot more powerful almost always than if you have it more laterally placed. Let's quickly give you guys a visual of why this may be so. So here we have simply set up two knights on the board, one for white, one for black. And what we've done is we've placed one knight, the black knight, on uh, one of the more central squares. And now let's take a look at its influence. Well, we can see that it is controlling the maximum number of squares that a knight can control at any given time, and that is eight squares. And we can see that obviously a knight being a short range piece, if it's in the middle of the board, it's not going to be affecting the sides of the board, right? However, the central squares, as we know, are more important than lateral squares. So if you place a knight on the center, of the board, it's going to not only influence as many squares as a knight can possibly influence, which is eight, but the squares that it influences are going to be extremely important squares. On the other hand, let's take a look at this unhappy white knight here. And we've purposely placed it on the corner of the board. And from there, you can see that in fact, it only has two squares to go to. So it only has a quarter of the reach of the other more central knight. And in fact, in this particular position, we can see that the e4 knight controls those two squares and so can be said to be dominating the knight on h1. And therefore, in this particular position, the h1 knight cannot even move without being captured. Now, there is one more fundamental point that I wanted to comment on, and that is that, of course, not all centralized knights are the same, right? There are different factors that make one centralized knight stronger than another. And a big factor that we want to just keep in mind is whether the knight is stable on that central post. So here we have an example of an incredibly stable knight, because not only is the knight defended twice, but importantly, because the pawns on the two adjacent files have already moved past the point where they can target the knight, no f3 or d3 moves going to be played anytime soon. Because of this, we have this perfect mix of a knight that is well defended and that cannot be well attacked. Knights particularly thrive in situations where the pawns that could control a particular square have advanced too far, leaving that weakness behind. This is an outpost, and a knight will jump into that outpost if it's a central outpost and be extremely happy in that square and can stay in that square for a very, very long time having a huge influence on the game. Outposts can and are regularly used by knights no matter where they are on the board, but if an outpost is let's say on b6 or on b5 or a5, they tend to have far less value than if they are in the center or somewhere quite close to the center. So that's another point to keep in mind. Let's take a look at first sight, perhaps similar position, but a very, very different one. In this position, we can see that it is black who has the more centralized knight. 
And yet, White actually is in a better situation with his knight. And the reason for this is because White can very soon in the future jump into this central square on e5. And as we see, the black pawns have pushed too far, so therefore the knight will be very stable on this e5 outpost. However, in the case of black's knight, the move pawn to f3 will kick out the knight. The fundamental difference here is that white's d pawn has advanced two squares and therefore there is no d3 move coming up in the future, but his f pawn remains on its starting square. Whereas for black, both the d pawn and the f pawn have advanced and therefore can no longer control the e5 square. So now we're going to start talking about what makes a bishop quite good and what makes it not so good. And for these purposes, we are continuing the trend of setting up, frankly, uh, somewhat ridiculous positions, but hopefully the point is illustrated well. So here, the point that we want to get across is we see that all of White's pawns are in fact on dark squares, while his bishop is the light squared bishop. Especially important is the fact that his central pawns are all on dark squares. They're the ones that matter the most when it comes to determining if your bishop is going to be a good piece. Here, on the other hand, we see that black's bishop is on the same color, not on the opposite color, but on the same color as all of his pawns. And what we're trying to illustrate is the fact that we want our bishop, in order to be a good bishop, we want it to be on the opposite color that our pawns, especially our more central pawns. The reason should be quite clear because when the pawns are on the opposite color, then our bishop is free to roam and influence the game. It should also be noted that our bishop will be more important in such situations because if we imagine, let's say, our king on g1, well, we can see that our pawn structure, right, all of our pawns are on dark squares. And therefore, our pawn structure is only protecting us along those dark squares. We have really, really good control of that set of squares. However, all of these light squares that are very near our king in this scenario, they're very weak and can be controlled by our opponent. Not here, of course, but if he had more pieces. And so our bishop is especially important as the defender of these weaknesses. So those are two big reasons why you value the bishop on the opposite color of where you have the majority of your pawns, especially your central pawns. Because number one, it will defend your weaknesses. And number two, it will be able to roam the board freely. Bishops are, are long range pieces. And when a bishop can influence a lot of squares, it's much more influential piece than say a knight where a knight is capped at eight squares we see that this is not the case for a bishop besides the square that this bishop is on right now on d3 we see that it's already controlling five squares on one diagonal and it's controlling an additional six squares on the other diagonal and that's not even let's say the most powerful square that a bishop can be on. If, for instance, we place the bishop on e4, then it would have access to the longest diagonal on the board and one of the longer diagonals on the board as well. So it would be even more powerful. Keep in mind that a knight only has eight squares that it can influence as its theoretical maximum. There is one question, however, which remains. And some of you may be asking yourselves this question. Well, we have two bishops, one light squared bishop and one dark squared bishop. So how do we ensure that both of our bishops will be well placed out of the opening if we have this problem, right? We put our pawns on dark squares, so we kill 
our dark squared bishop, it becomes a bad bishop, much like this, maybe less extreme, but similar principle. And on the other hand, if we put our pawns on light squares, well, we'll kill our light squared bishop. This is a very good question. And there's a couple of things to say about it. Well, chess players have devised different strategies to try and solve this potential problem. And you see this across a whole bunch of openings, right? Let's actually show that so that you can hopefully understand the concept better. So what we're going to do is we're going to just show the first few moves here of a variation of an opening called the Nimzo Indian Defense, which is a very popular opening. So white opens with pawn to d4. Black brings his knight out to f6, c4, e6, knight c3. And here notice how black brings his bishop out to b4. Well, in fact, I should say this move actually has many reasons behind it, and we cannot possibly explain them all, but two of the main ones are actually the centralization of knights. And notice how this knight on f6 is eyeing up the e4 square, and the white knight on c3 also eyes up the e4 square. So by first pinning and eventually possibly removing this knight, black gains control of that e4 square and looks to centralize his knight, which is a topic we've recently discussed. So imagine that white continued e3, castle, knight to f3. Now notice this move, black goes pawn to d6. And we see for now, black has a little bit of a strange situation because remember the first thing we talked about was space. It's necessary in order to get good squares for your pieces. The second thing we talked about was centralized knights. And then the third thing now that we're discussing is with bishops, you want in order to get a good bishop out of an opening, you want to have the central pawns on the other color squares to your bishop. But when you have two bishops, that can be tricky to achieve. So here white goes bishop to d3. Black continues with knight c6, castle, and now bishop takes c3 at the final moment. Because otherwise, now the knight is no longer pinned to the king on e1. And so in theory, the knight may move. So black now captures on c3, pawn takes c3. He's given up what we call the bishop pair, which in general is not something that either side wants to do. There are many exceptions. This is one of them, of course. But we see the point here with his next move, pawn to e5. And notice what black did. Very clever plan. He first stepped his bishop, the bishop that he knew would end up being the bad bishop, right? Because he had a plan of placing his central pawns on dark squares. So he stepped his bishop out of the pawn chain, right? Is the sort of the chess lingo for this type of maneuver. And then he left himself only with the light squared bishop. And then he planted his pawns. Remember where they were in the beginning? We see here pawns are in fact on light squares and we see how only a few moves later if we jump to this position here well the pawns each of them have advanced one square so they've gone onto the dark central squares leaving black with a strong bishop so hopefully that makes what you should watch out for with not one bishop but in fact both of your bishops what you should aim for as a general rule Hopefully that's clear. Let us now move on to the remaining pieces. Let's next tackle the queen. When it comes to the queen, I would say that the best way of describing sort of bringing the queen into the game in the opening stage of the game would be that it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, the queen being such a powerful piece is able to create many threats very, very quickly. So in openings where you bring your queen out on move four or five or even earlier, you immediately have a lot of firepower. However, precisely because the queen is such a powerful piece, it's worth a lot. And the further out that you bring the queen, 
the more likely that it will be targeted by your opponent. And that's why I say that it truly is a double-edged sword. Let's take, for example, a well-known opening, which is the Scandinavian defense that follows after e4, d5. Now here, white captures the pawn, and in fact, the Scandinavian defense begins after the move queen takes d5. Now, white immediately plays the move knight to c3, which develops with tempo, as we say. What do I mean by this? Well, white plays a developing move, and because he attacks the queen, that development is sped up. In chess, we call that developing with tempo. And here, black can actually play and does play several different moves. He can go queen to d6, queen to d8, or queen to a5. They all have their pros and cons. Queen to d8, for instance, is the safer bet. But on the other hand, it's a little bit passive because the queen is not doing anything from d8 for now. And white simply has a development lead. He could continue with a move like knight to f3, and we see his advantage in development. Queen to a5 is a little bit more risky, but it's also a little bit more ambitious. White could proceed with d4, knight f6, knight f3, c6, bishop to c4, bishop to f5, and here this move, bishop d2. We see immediately that the queen is a target. And in fact, a theory continues with the move pawn to e6, ignoring the x ray on the queen. And white actually leverages this with the main move being knight to d5 in this position. So the knight cannot be captured because the queen is being attacked. So now black has to go queen to d8. And we can see what has happened with the black queen. It's gone queen to d5, queen to a5, and now queen to d8. There are reasons behind this maneuvering, but the point is that when you bring the queen out early in the game, it's going to be a potential nuisance to your opponent, but it's also going to be a potential target for your opponent. That's why I say it's a double-edged sword. Let's take a look at one more example that shows what can happen when things go wrong after bringing your queen out early in the game. So white here plays the move pawn to e4, and after c5, knight f3, d6, d4, pawn takes, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3, a6, bishop to g5, e6, f4, queen to b6, we see that black is the first one to bring out his queen, and here this position is in fact a very, very well-known position, highly theoretical and highly risky for both sides, because we see that double-edged nature. On the one hand, the queen intends to capture the pawn on b2 if white does not defend it, but on the other, after white's main move, which is queen to d2 in this position, white invites black to run the gauntlet, and if he does so, he is at risk if he's not careful of his queen coming under attack. And in fact, this whole variation is known as the poisoned pawn variation of the Sicilian Nidorf system. So it should give you an idea of just how dangerous pawn grabbing early on with your queen can be. White can play knight to b3 here. And let's just show one example. By the way, this whole variation is you know, I'm not doing it justice by saying that it's about the queen grabbing a pawn or anything like that. So I'm not implying that there's, there's a lot going on in this variation. And a lot of the problems actually, just as a FYI of sorts, a lot of the problems actually have to do with the king coming under an attack, which in part does have to do with another subtler point of bringing out your queen very early on, which is that if your queen is now like on b2, playing an offensive role, the price to pay is that it cannot play uh, such a good defensive role as if the queen remained on d8 
next to the black king. So, for example, let's show to return to the topic after knight to b3, black goes knight to c6, imagine, then bishop takes, pawn takes, and white now goes knight to a4. So we see the black queen is attacked, and so black has to move, queen to a3, and now knight to b6, attacking the rook on a8, rook goes to b8, and now knight to c4. This has actually been played several times. Now the queen is attacked once again, and queen to a4 is the only square available to it. And now let's take a look at a sort of a crafty move by white pawn to a3. And we'll see what's intended here very soon. Rook to g8, let's say bishop to d3. And now if black were to be sloppy here and play a careless move bishop to e7, he would find himself completely lost after knight to b6. We see that the queen has been quarreled here. We see that there are simply no squares for the queen between the pawn, the knight, of course, the attacking knight on b6, the bishop that controls the e4 point, the knight on b3 also controlling the d4 square. We see that the queen has nowhere to go, and this very clever move, pawn to a3 earlier, was actually designed at restricting the movement of the black queen. So that's it as far as our discussion of the queen in the opening goes. The main takeaway, I would say, is that the queen and developing it early on in the opening is truly a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you can create a lot of threats and that can outweigh any negatives. On the other hand, you may regret your, in this case, pawn grabbing or any, any other reason for bringing out the queen very early on because it will be an easy target for your opponent. And by targeting your queen, usually in the very, very best case scenario for the side with the queen, best case scenario, you are wasting some time, some moves, just escaping the attack. And worst case scenario, such as in this final position here, you cannot escape the attack at all and you have to resign the game.